here this morning. I'm going to introduce folks very, very quickly, and uh, uh, Congressman Yoder uh, has to uh, run for uh, House business uh, quickly, so I'm going to have him lead off, and then I'm going to make a few remarks about our report, and then we'll hear uh, from the other uh, panelists. So let me start by introducing Congressman Yoder, who's a, a U.S. Congressman from Kansas. He serves on the Appropriations Committee, including on the subcommittees of uh, Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies. Uh, financial services, general government, and military construction, and military construction, veteran affairs, and related agencies. Uh, prior to being elected to Congress recently, uh, Representative Yoder served as a state representative in the Kansas legislature, uh, representing the Overland Park and Leewood areas. Uh, and he also chaired the Kansas House Appropriations Committee during the recent uh, economic crisis. Uh, he also has uh, multiple degrees from University of Kansas, including political science, English, and law degrees which is probably a useful combination for what you're doing now, except for English. <laughs> and uh, uh, next to Congressman Yoder is uh, obviously uh, needs no introduction, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who is the director of uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, really does need no introduction. He's a phys phys physician geneticist, a geneticist known for landmark discoveries of disease genes. Uh, and his leadership of the uh, International uh, Human Genome Project, which uh, really probably ranks as one of the all-time top innovations in, in human history. Uh, he served as director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH from 93 to 2008. And before coming to NIH, he was uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of Michigan. And he's also been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National <coughs> Medal of Science. Uh, Scott Bruder. Is uh, to my immediate left is senior vice president and chief science and technology officer of BD Biosciences. Uh, unlike myself, which only has you can only call a doctor once, you can call Scott doctor twice because he has a PhD and an MD. Uh, in this position, he's responsible for uh, uh, providing technology strategy and development leadership to BD uh, as it focuses on innovation and impact. Uh, in medical devices. He also spent eight years at J&J, &J, uh, where he developed corporate-wide strategies and led the creation of J&J Regenerative Therapeutics, uh, and also served in a number of other biotechnology companies in his career. He has a, uh, a PhD in stem cell biology, and also has further clinical training from the Albert Einstein Medical Center and University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and last, uh, but not least, Landon King. Uh, He's a doctor and the David Marine Professor of Medicine and Biological Chemistry uh, and the Director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he has been there for 17 years. Um, he has a, um, a medical degree in 1989 from Vanderbilt University. Uh, he's also a full professor at Johns Hopkins and in 2006 was elected to the American Society for Clinical Investigation. So we really have an unbelievably distinguished panel today. We're just going to get right to it with the Representative Governor. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to address you all briefly and take a minute before we head over to committee. I'm a little bit intimidated by the panel, so I think I'm heading out because uh, you looked at their bios. It's uh, pretty staggering and impressive. Uh, certainly, this is a sobering moment. We're discussing here the report and the information that uh, uh, the, the country looks at in terms of competitiveness around the world. Uh, it's certainly an issue that Congress has to keep its finger on. So I'm here today really to learn and listen and be a part of the discussion. I do want to recognize a couple of friends that are in the room, and that's Dr. Jensen from the University of Kansas, which is in my district medical center, and he's ahead of our uh, Cancer Institute efforts there, and then uh, David Weissong, who I serve with in the legislature as a state senator there. So it's good to have folks from Kansas. Uh, for those of you who are not from uh, D.C., welcome to town. For those of you who are from here, my apologies. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> certainly, it's, I, yeah, it's very, if you like humid weather, then stick around for a while. You'll enjoy the summer. Uh, I am a fresh member of Congress. I'm in my first term. Certainly a tumultuous time in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's no secret that there is a significant battle over spending and resources. Uh, I was appointed to the Appropriations Committee as a freshman member, which some may look at as a blessing, others as a curse, uh, but I do have the opportunity to be part of this national dialogue that certainly affects research dollars for the National Institutes of Health and other areas, and so I've been pleased to be part of that debate and part of those very difficult decisions. You know, certainly when you look at the fiscal challenges our country's facing with the $16 trillion debt, national debt that grows by the billions every day, 
Uh, you can't really have a conversation about where to spend money without figuring out how we're going to generate the resources necessary and how we're going to move towards uh, a balanced uh, uh, budget in this country. And so uh, there's been a real battle about, given the economic situation we're facing with 8% unemployment, uh, when is the right time to make reductions? Where do you make those reductions? And there's sort of been an either or choice laid before the country. Either we're going to move to a period of austerity or we're going to move to a period of, of uh, continued stimulation of the economy. Uh, and you really have to decide which do you believe in in terms of which economic theory makes the most sense. And I wonder if that's a false choice for the country. Uh, as we look at the uh, choices before us in Washington, it may not have to be an either or proposition. Certainly the idea that we would cut spending to get towards a balanced budget, both parties have, uh, uh, have, have given uh, the uh, speeches and indicated that's one of the avenues we have to take. Uh, but certainly reprioritization of dollars we are spending seems to make a lot of sense when you're in a, a battle over limited resources. And so when we look at stimulus dollars, when we look at where we're going to spend our scarce resources, I think it makes sense that when we're trying to find ways for the parties to come together, I think a great way to come together is to say, look, we're going to have to reduce the overall amount of expenditures in the federal government, and we're going to really hammer areas that don't have the greatest impact on economic growth. That's an area that both sides ought to be able to agree on, that if we're going to spend federal dollars, we ought to spend those federal dollars in a way that has the greatest impact on the economy and the greatest impact on the future prosperity of the country. You can think of really no better way to do that than investment in research that not only uh, puts people to work today, and I think just looking at statistics, uh, NIH uh, research funding uh, led to 432,000 jobs in 2011, generated $62 billion of new economic activity across the country. And so you know, I'm committed to when we spend federal dollars that are precious and scarce, that we spend those in a way that has the greatest impact on the future of the economy. Uh, and so I don't know that, that it has to be a, a two worlds approach here we might be able to get the parties to come together in an agreement that uh, let's put these dollars to their highest and best use. Uh, to indicate where some of us are in that, I've supported additional uh, spending in areas of um, research. Uh, our, we requested that the uh, Labor uh, HHS committees provide $32 billion for National Institute of Health funding, which is an increase of $1.14 billion over 2012 funding. So it doesn't help to be doom and gloom. We've also asked for an increase of funding for uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, area of the NIH as well. So trying to provide the resources necessary to move forward. Um, you know, you look at the statistics and things that research has been able to do, not only from a job creation perspective, which is a unifier, but also just in terms of uh, its impact on uh, longevity. And you just look at the basic statistics of child born uh, today has an average lifespan of 78 years, nearly three decades longer than a baby born in 1900. That's real tangible differences in every American's lives, every, every uh, person's life around the world, but certainly here in the United States. Um, the uh, NIH is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world, and so when you look at longevity, and you look at our role, uh, we have an impact here uh, every day in the decisions we make in Congress of whether we're gonna have continue uh, expanding longevity, whether we're gonna continue spend, uh, our efforts to be the largest uh, funder of research in the world, or whether we're going to decline. And I think today the conversation we're going to have is one that indicates that we need to renew our commitment in these areas. And so as a freshman member, a Republican member uh, of Congress, I want to let you know that many of us understand and we get the importance uh, of uh, NIH funding, and we're going to try to continue to find a balanced way to make sure that we uh, stay true to our commitments and continue to be a global leader in uh, research around the world. So thanks for having me today, and good luck with the rest of your panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, for your leadership on this on this issue. Okay, um, so I'm going to just jump right in uh, to the results from our report. Uh, just a couple things before I do that. I want to thank my. Uh, I really shouldn't say co-authors because I did very little on this other than, other than uh, advice. But my lead authors are Stephen Azell, uh, Luke Stewart, and Val Giddings at ITIFL leads our life sciences practice. Stephen leads our competitive practice. So thank you so much. And also to the great partnership with UMR uh, in helping to make this report possible. Um, secondly, uh, those of you who can or want to, if you want to tweet about this uh, today or blog about it, I think it's an important report to get the word out. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, which I'm sure most of you do, you've already seen my tweet about this this morning. <laughs> and lastly, we will adjourn uh, no later than 11.20. So, um, okay.
So when you think about this question, I've been doing a lot of speaking around the world and listening to a lot, a lot of foreign delegations come to the U.S. all around this question of competitiveness. And we may not be competitive in some things. Germans, for example, are very good at engineering-based innovation. But really what we lead the world and continue to lead the world in is science-based innovation. And one of the principal reasons we lead the world in science-based innovation is because of the commitment we've had since World War II on up through uh, President Nixon's commitment on the war on cancer to the bipartisan commitment in the last decade and the beginning part of this decade to double NIH. But it's the commitment we've made to medical science and funding that research at our universities and other places that really has enabled the U.S. to be a leader in science-based innovation and a leader in innovation in health uh, and, and biomedical. Unfortunately, though, that leadership is under threat. Um, Actually, I should back up and say, these are just a, one, one example of companies that have emerged pretty much directly because of the investments that the U.S. government made at university-based biomedical research. Um, I think, Scott, you were you're from Brown, is that right? Uh, back in the 90s, I led the Governor's Economic Policy Council in Rhode Island. And um, we had, uh, for some strange reason, I, other than, I guess it must have been Brown, we had uh, this inordinate amount of, of tissue engineering and cellular research in the, in the country. For a little teeny state of Rhode Island, we had, we had like 10 times more than our share. It was due to Brown. And we set up a program to help uh, fund early stage business model ideas at Brown, to help incubate the industry. And one of the reasons why that was a successful strategy, and why it's a successful strategy around the country, is biomedical innovation is sort of one of the one of the only real innovations, or one of the best, where the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So it's some innovations you kind of get it, you commercialize it in India. Uh, what biomedical innovation is, is, is unique in a way is it tends to get commercialized very, very close to where it's invented, and that's why you see big biomedical economic hubs around places with great research universities, uh, Baltimore. Uh, Philadelphia, Boston, Seattle, San Diego, San Francisco, uh, and certainly other places. So um, the other part of this, besides all the, you know, if, if we didn't really care about anything else other than uh, uh, health, we would invest a lot of this because it is, it is critical to improving human well-being. Uh, but it also leads to enormous economic benefits. So those benefits, a 30% annualized societal rate of return, those do not include health benefits. Uh, and today, the life sciences industry has 7 million jobs, uh, 50, 80, excuse me, uh, 69 billion, 69 billion dollars in GDP. And what's important about that is that we suffer competitive challenges in many industries. We've lost manufacturing jobs in many industries, but life sciences is an industry we still have a lot of competitive advantage in, and we can continue to win in that industry. But one of the key ways of winning in that industry uh, is we've got to continue to fund the, the seed corn, if you will, the, the real basic research that enables these spin-offs, these companies to emerge, and helps the larger companies as well. Um, now, Congress, as you all know, made a big commitment to do that uh, with the doubling program in the early 90s and late, uh, or late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, but the problem is that that commitment has flagged. Uh, we are now about 25% under where we should be if we had stayed with the doubling. Uh, as, as in terms of real dollars. So we have some work to cut up for us. Uh, one of the results of that has been that it is now much, much more difficult uh, for uh, investigators to get to win awards from NIH. I know you'd like to fix that problem. Uh, <laughs> there are only two ways to fix it. You could tell people not, not to apply. Not the right answer. Okay. <laughs> Why I'm not an NIH. <laughs> Perhaps the other answer is more resources. But the average age now of a uh, um, the, the, the average age of an investigator uh, to, who receives an award, a first time recipient, has increased from 34 in 1970 to 42 in 2005. So we're really making it hard for researchers to get that. And one of the other uh, problems with that is it tends to lead to more conservative proposals. Uh, higher risk ones may have a harder time getting funding. So it's not just an overall level of, of uh, resources. Now. In one level, we say, okay, well, we're not investing as much as we should. We've got all these problems. It doesn't really matter because nobody else in the world is going to do anything because they see us as we're being in the lead and we're untouchable. I really wish that was the case, too, but it's not. You look around the world, country after country has put in place national biomedical economic leadership strategies, and they see this as a source of high-wage jobs, 
sustainable jobs and important jobs. Uh, we, didn't, we did a number of case studies in the report, uh, China, Singapore, the UK, the US. But one country we didn't do a case study on, just because we didn't have room, was Denmark. And you'll see in a little bit, Denmark's a really interesting country, a little small country, but they've made biomedical innovation a centerpiece of their national competitive strategy. And they've put a lot of money into this, and the money does two things. It creates new companies, but it also trains the workforce that they need so that when international companies want to come and locate in Denmark, they know they're going to get really the, some of the best and the brightest scientists. So we see that in terms of what other countries are doing now. China is investing $308 billion over the next five years. Uh, as a share of GDP, this is four times what we are going to be expected to be investing here in biomedical research. Uh, they have more gene sequencers at the Chinese Genomic Institute, whatever the new name of it is. BGI. BGI, Beijing Genomic Institute. They have more genomic sequencers there than they do in the United States. Now, that's not to say that China's a perfect country. I'm on the president's China-U.S. <coughs> innovation experts group, and we spent a lot of time in China. But I'll tell you, when you throw that many resources at the problem and you train that many geneticists and biomedical scientists, you are going to get some positive results, and they have. Uh, but also other countries, Germany, India, Singapore, Sweden, UK, are all increasing that. And this, you, you can see this, uh, this here. Uh, the blue line is in the United States. Um, by the way, I should say, this, this, is a very, this is one of the hardest things we've ever done because the data are so poor. Very, very difficult international data problems. But that, look at where the blue line goes down from the US. Just pretend that doesn't exist. That's a, essentially a classification problem, which we have to report because that's the official data. So just pretend that those little bits there in 2002. But what you see is that blue line from essentially 2003 uh, going down. And then you look at these other countries there uh, where you see you know, significant increases uh, where we see, for example, Sweden, uh, which is a major biomedical leader, uh, Norway, Denmark, Austria, uh, where they've either, made, they've either been stable or they've had significant increases. So this is really, I think, the permanent trend when we talk to other countries about this, uh, one of the things that we always ask is, uh, how are you able to get the political commitment to do this? And, and why are you able to do this in the midst of budget crises? And what they always say, every single country we've talked to, we think this is the most important thing we can do. If we are not going to have a competitive global economy with high wage jobs, then we're not going to be able to solve the budget crisis. We're not going to be able to do uh, and, and grow our overall economy. We see this result uh, in patents, uh, where the U.S. share of biomedical patents, while still very strong, uh, is, is slipping somewhat. Again, because other countries are making big commitments. We see this now in terms of global share of output. So this is inflation adjusted. This is, uh, this is just the amount of value-added output that each country has. You can see the U.S. peaked in the uh, uh, early 2000s and has been going down. Uh, Europe sort of stable, went up a little bit down. What's interesting there is Japan has had really the biggest loss, uh, with China picking up an enormous share. So if you just extrapolate those trends, which I'm not sure you can, but if you do, you'll see China ahead of us by the end of the decade in terms of global share of biomedical uh, life sciences output. And you see the results also in terms of the trade surplus. Uh, you can see Singapore made a major effort to fund and support biomedical research through a program called Biopolis. Uh, they have a very positive trade surplus in, uh, in the biomedical industry. Germany, France, United Kingdom, India. Uh, we do not anymore. Uh, and it is, I think, a representation of the challenge we face and also the lack of commitment. So what do we need to do? Well, I think first thing, and I, I want to echo what Representative Yoder said, but I thought his comments were very insightful. There's a difference between spending and investment. And we've got to recognize that. Not all spending is the same. Uh, some actually generates very positive societal rates of return, like biomedical uh, science research. Huge societal rates of return. Others, frankly, has negative rates of return. So what we've got to do is prioritize the budget process to differentiate between investment uh, and innovation. Secondly, we have to recognize that uh, one way, not the only way, but one important way to address the budget deficit is to grow the economy. And biomedical research certainly has shown that it does, it does grow the economy. Uh, the more we can grow the economy, the more federal taxes will, will also raise. So what do we need to do? Um, we have several recommendations in the report. One is to uh, get back on the path of doubling. 
uh, we would argue we need uh, sustained, steady increases in NIH funding to get back to 2.5% uh, of GDP, which is where we were uh, at the end of the doubling process. Second, uh, we also, I'm sorry to say this, Dr. Collins, but you're not the only agency that funds research here. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are other agencies like the DOE, uh, USDA. We saw a great article this morning, two great articles this morning, by the way, in the Washington Post. They're really timely. One was an article about uh, uh, new discoveries, uh, uh, breakthroughs on uh, brain-computer interface, and there was a um, study done in New funded some of that research, uh, maybe a lot of it, uh, at Brown uh, and uh, Harvard and other universities, where there was uh, they're able to now implant computer chips in the brain of paralyzed uh, individuals, who then can think and move a robotic arm. And so, for the first time, this woman who'd been paralyzed for many, many years. Uh, was able to actually use a robotic arm to pick up and drink fluids. Amazing, amazing. And let's just be honest, it would be real. there is no way that research would have been done without federal support, without NIH support. Another interesting study this morning about uh, brain trauma uh, and, uh, the, and how soldiers uh, having brain trauma are similar to NFL football players. But again, federally funded research that's critical. Uh, one of the problems we have is this roller coaster. Um, we need to have stable or steady increases, not going up 80% and down 20%. You know, we need to have stable increases over time so that you and all the organizations and institutions in the country that have to plan around this funding being there are able to do this. Uh, and lastly, well, funding uh, science is sort of the core, if you will, at the bottom of the pyramid, kind of the core thing we need to do. If we want to grow a competitive uh, and, and expand our competitiveness in this industry, we've got to do other policies too. Uh, we would argue FDA reform is important. Val Giddings is leading a report on that to get uh, better and faster and, and more uh, stable drug approval and device approval. Certainly high skill immigration uh, is important. We don't produce all the bioscientists we, we, uh, we might need. Targeted trade enforcement, there are a lot of things other countries are doing in terms of patent infringement, uh, uh, stealing essentially our intellectual property that we worked hard to invest in. Uh, and lastly, tax policy. You see a country like the UK, uh, again, in the midst of a major budget crisis, worse than ours, they've committed uh, to um, actually stable and, and a little bit of increases in, in the research funding while they're cutting everything else. And also to a program called the Patent Box, which is a new tax policy to reduce taxes on uh, patentable income. And the reason they did that, the single major reason they did that, was because they want to grow their biomedical industry. So with that, I will close and just, and again, just uh, commend to you to read uh, this report and to help uh, share the findings with your colleagues because uh, I think at the end of the day, we're, we're, in a, we're in a really unique position where we, we have lost competitive advantage in a number of industries in the U.S. and frankly, it's too late to do anything about some of those industries. This is not one of them. This is one where we still have an enormous set of strengths, but if we don't do the right thing, we could be looking at a situation in 10 years where we're in much, much worse shape. So with that, thank you, and uh, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Well, thank you, Rob, for presenting uh, some of the really sobering information uh, that has been generated in, in this, I think, landmark analysis that I hope everybody in the room and Lots of other people uh, who are learning about this this morning will take with the greatest seriousness. Uh, it was not my hope when I accepted the position of director of the NIH that we would be gathered here to talk about leadership in decline. Uh, but in fact, the facts that have been laid in front of you indicate that America's leadership position, which was unchallenged in biomedical research areas 20 years ago, is now very much in question. I really want to thank ITIF and UMR uh, for organizing this effort and for doing the due diligence to dig out all of the facts because I think at this time, if you're going to try to have an impact on decision makers, it isn't enough to simply tell an anecdote or two. You have to be able to document uh, exactly what the trends look like and the graphs that you have seen and the facts that go along with those. Uh, I don't think anybody can look at it without feeling a sense of alarm in terms of what's happened to America's position. And if we are concerned, and we all are, uh, about our economic status and about how we're going to pull ourselves out of this current financial crunch, and certainly Congressman Yoder spoke about uh, what a stress that is for anybody who's thinking about appropriations, 
uh, we have to consider what are some of the areas that could be of greatest assistance in, in regrowing our economy. Looking back over what's been the source of America's uh, strength economically since World War II, uh, most eco economists agree uh, that it's investments in science, technology, and innovation that's responsible for more than 50% of that growth. And this is the 21st century, the century of biology. I think most people in the uh, sciences see this as the opportunity for biology to emerge as a truly quantitative digital science taking its rightful place alongside physics and chemistry because of this uh, amazing ability we have now to be able to understand how life works, but also to understand how disease occurs. For me as a physician and a scientist, the scientific opportunities right now are truly exhilarating. The, the rate of acquisition of new knowledge is breathtaking. We have the chance to ask and answer questions that were really unthinkable uh, a decade ago. It just would not have seemed possible that you could uh, do the kinds of things that are now being done in our laboratories around this country. But of course, increasingly being done elsewhere as well. NIH has as its major mission the improvements in human health uh, that we aim to achieve by basic science, by translational work, by clinical research, uh, to try to continue this long tradition of improving longevity, reducing suffering, reducing disabilities. And I think our track record is extremely strong. But in this climate, it almost seems like it's not enough uh, to say that what we're about is to improve human health. We have to also justify uh, expenditures coming from the taxpayers in terms of how those will boost uh, our sagging economy. And here, as you have heard, from this study and uh, others that have been done along these same lines, the case is extremely strong. And if, as Congressman Yoder says, the decision makers have to, in this difficult time, make decisions about where to invest and where not to, uh, this is the kind of data that I hope will influence that in a strong way. I'll tell you one personal experience that plays into this that was already alluded to uh, in, in Rob's very nice summary of the, the, the report. I had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project. And that was a remarkable experience uh, from 1990 until 2003, an effort to do something that people, at the time it was first announced, thought was pretty improbable. Uh, in fact, the scientific community was not that supportive of the Human Genome Project in 1990. Uh, I came to the leadership role in 1993 and carried this through for the next 10 years, oftentimes wondering whether the skeptics had been right, but in fact, that the genius uh, of American science was never more apparent than in that uh, remarkable adventure. The inspiration uh, that came to us uh, from scientists, many of them coming from different fields of computational expertise, or robotics, or physics, or chemistry, all gathering together because this was such a historic opportunity. And then in 2003, two years ahead of schedule, and uh, $400 million under budget, delivering this first sequence of the human genome. Now that was an international effort, and it was a good thing, because after all, DNA is our shared inheritance. But the U.S. had the lead. We did about 60% of the work. I had the privilege, therefore, of being the field general of this enterprise, which involved 20 laboratories in six countries. Recent analysis done by Battelle uh, to see exactly what has been the economic benefit of the Genome Project's success is pretty breathtaking. The U.S. government spent, when you add up the NIH contribution and the Department of Energy's contribution to the Genome Project, about $4 billion over those 13 years. As of last year, Battelle calculated that the economic return to the United States of this successful effort was $796 billion. Now, even if you throw in some inflation that happened in between those numbers, you end up with 141 to 1 return on investment. I have not heard of other investments that the government has made any time recently that measure even close to that in terms of the return. If the Human Genome Project were proposed today, would we be able to generate enough enthusiasm uh, to get it going? Or would this also be seen as something that we just can't do because of our fiscal stresses? <clears throat> and I have to say that despite that $796 billion worth of returns, when you look at what's happened to America in the last 10 years since the completion of the Genome Project, we have basically ceded leadership in genomics, which was unquestioned for us in 2003. 
uh, to other places and particularly to China. Uh, if you go to Shenzhen, uh, to the BGI, uh, you will see there a remarkable facility with 4,000 of the smartest Chinese scientists that you would ever hope to be all working together in a renovated shoe factory that's been turned into an absolute marvel uh, of technological achievement and is populated not only with people but with instrumentation uh, which exceeds anything we have in the U.S. And that happens so quickly that probably people hardly even noticed it was happening. That's just one example of the trajectory that we are on. And this report, I think, brings that into sharp focus, not just from my anecdote about genomics, but across the whole spectrum of what we have invested and what we have reaped as rewards as a result of that. One of the points that I think the report makes that I particularly want to highlight is just how important it will be if we're going to retrieve our leadership. Not only to have reasonable resources, and clearly uh, we have lost about 20% of our purchasing power in the last nine years, but also to have a stable trajectory going forward. This business of not knowing uh, from year to year, sometimes from month to month, what the resources are going to be for biomedical research is enormously destabilizing. The thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night right now is what's happening to the young scientists in our biomedical research community who are starting up their laboratories, who have dreams of making the next breakthrough that's going to solve cancer or Alzheimer's disease, and who are just not sure whether the system is going to support those dreams or not. They see what's going on. Uh, they see these herky-jerky decision-making processes that leave you uncertain from month to month about what's going to happen. They read about the possible sequesters that might result uh, in an 8% cut in the NIH budget on January 2nd, 2013 in one fell swoop, uh, which would be utterly devastating uh, to the ability to support those investigators. If we could uh, get beyond that feast or famine, and unfortunately it's been more famine than feast, and, and have a trajectory that was predictable, that would be enormously supportive of the enterprise, and yet it's uh, something which has been very difficult, I think, uh, to be able to make the case successfully for in the current climate. You heard the statistics about what other countries are doing. I'll tell you one more story, and then I'll sit down. One of the roles that I play is to try to work with the heads of other international research organizations that support biomedical research. Uh, a group called the HIROs, the heroes we call ourselves, although we don't feel very heroic all the time. Uh, and we meet every six months. So this is the people who are the heads of the major funding agencies in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, Japan, China, India, <coughs> South Africa, Canada, uh, Sweden, Finland, New Zealand. Um, and we all sort of sit around the table and tell stories about the things that are giving us the hardest time. No other staff in the room, it's all very informal. And it's really quite sobering when we have that conversation and we'll be meeting again in a couple of weeks. Everybody, of course, is aware of the tough situation that the world is facing economically. But as we go around the table and I hear what each of those other funding agencies are doing, they are all looking at increases. Uh, in their support for biomedical research, even though their countries in some instances are struggling. And for places like China and India, they're looking at double-digit percentage increases. China now about 25% in one year going up in its R&D support next year. And I'm the only guy sitting at the table going, well, we'll be lucky if we're flat. And of course, flat really means we'll lose about 3% of our buying power to inflation. So what do they know that we don't seem to know? They know that their way uh, to retrieve themselves from tough economic times uh, is to support this research. It creates jobs. It has a return on investment that happens almost immediately. It puts them in a position to work with industry uh, to be able to produce the outputs that you saw and to keep those vigorously in their own country. It creates a, an opportunity for the best and brightest in their country to stay there instead of feeling like they have to go somewhere else. The US alone around that table uh, is on a different path. It is my hope uh, that this thoughtful, unflinching report uh, of those trajectories uh, will attract enough attention to help us realize that our dominance of biomedical research cannot be taken anymore as a given. It is under serious threat. We celebrate the achievements of those other countries, but we shouldn't be walking away, leaving the stage open for everyone else to have the most exciting adventure you can imagine 
over the next few decades, which is the unraveling of how life works, how disease occurs, how to prevent it, how to treat it. This is our opportunity to lose, and we must not lose it. Thank you. Thank you. express my gratitude to UMR and ITIF for organizing this morning's forum. I'd like to thank Dr. Collins. It's uh, tough to follow those sobering remarks, uh, uh, but quite provocative and thoughtful indeed. Uh, I'm here today as a representative of the life science industry, and BD is like many U.S.-based companies. We're pleased to be active in the UMR, and we appreciate the excellent work that they've done uh, with ITIF to highlight the important role that NIH plays in our nation's economy. Now, very briefly, BD was founded in 1897 by two entrepreneurs who actually met on a business trip and started a medical device company. BD has since grown into a global medical technology company with substantial research and development as well as manufacturing presence here in the United States and exports more than it imports. With more than 12,000 U.S. associates located in over a dozen states, we continue to invest in our U.S. operations alongside our efforts to meet the demands of global markets. Now, I have some thoughts and I'd like to briefly discuss how the federal investment in biomedical research is so vital to our nation's prosperity in three critical ways from my perspective. First, as mentioned, the NIH funds basic research, which expands our knowledge base, creating scientific opportunities that the private sector can build upon over time. The NIH research supports the first leg of what I like to call the relay race against human disease. And as the lead-off runner, it fuels early-stage discovery that stimulate a two- to three-fold larger investment by the private sector to complete the research and development, clinical testing, and commercialization of products that improve human health. A good example of this teamwork, or baton passing as I call it, is a technology called flow cytometry. Now, during Nixon's war on cancer, a promising Stanford University researcher received an NIH grant that helped him develop a machine to count and sort human cells, particularly from blood, at what was then an incredible speed of 1,000 cells per second. Private investment from BD and other companies has turned flow cytometry instruments and reagents into a multi-billion dollar industry, an indispensable tool used by hospitals and university laboratories around the world. Now, long after that NIH investment, U.S. companies continue to lead the world in this technology. And we at BD alone employ hundreds of scientists and engineers who continue to design and ma manufacture flow cytometers that are better, smaller, and faster for use around the world. In fact, we can now count and sort cells at the incredible speed of 50,000 cells per second with multi-perimeter analysis. Now, flow cytometry plays this critical role in unraveling the mysteries of cellular biology and our immune system, as Dr. Collins referenced. It's helping to diagnose and monitor a wide range of diseases, from HIV AIDS to leukemia and lymphoma, as well as improving life-saving treatments like bone marrow transplantation. It's become so central to medical care that there have been over 100,000 scientific papers referenced that use this technology alone, initially funded by the NIH. NIH is helping to lay similar scientific groundwork in an emerging field that Rob referred to previously as tissue engineering or regenerative medicine, which represents an opportunity to revolutionize the treatment of devastating diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and neurodegenerative conditions, including Alzheimer's. It leverages many different scientific disciplines in order to repair or replace these diseased or damaged tissue. And the first wave of regenerative products are already used to treat wounds, cartilage defects, and diabetic foot ulcers. But this represents just the tip of the iceberg. We have to be uh, positive that NIH will have the resources to continue to play this critical role in the race against disease, or the U.S. will indeed fall behind in this and other cutting edge and highly promising areas of research. The second way that NIH is critical to U.S. prosperity is the role it plays in helping to train the next generation of scientists. As the beneficiary of an NIH training grant myself, I can say that such support is paramount to the development of top-tier scientists and engineers who can both hand off and accept the baton in the scientific relay race I described above. 
whether serving as professors in academia or leaders in the private sector, NIH-trained researchers are amongst the most competitive athletes of their kind in the world. For over 60 years, NIH has set the international standards for the quality and rigor of scientific pursuit, inspiring generations of investigators to achieve their best. NIH is the lifeblood of the biomedical research community, and without it, our most talented minds will simply gravitate to other fields or leave the U.S. for growing research opportunities in other countries, as described by Rob earlier. A decline in NIH investment will result in a cadre of scientists and technologies that are simply less competitive than what other countries will produce, and we heard about this in detail. I want to end by highlighting the third critical impact of NIH funding on U.S. prosperity. The practical performance of biomedical research requires the design, manufacturing, and sales of advanced research tools made by U.S. companies. These activities underpin the economic engine of our multi-billion dollar industry in research tools alone that create high paying jobs and generate tax revenues for the state and federal government. And because over one third of university research budgets depend on NIH, and these universities are key customers to the U.S. companies, federal biomedical research funding is important to research tool companies. The biotech startups are incredibly dependent on NIH funding as venture capital in the tight economic times has become harder to secure. So unfortunately, the nearly decade-long erosion of funding at NIH is having a negative effect on the U.S. research tools sector alone. So many of us here today have participated in complex policy debates about how to fine-tune the U.S. intellectual property laws, tax laws, and improve the regulatory process in order to promote scientific innovation and grow our economy. Federal support for basic biomedical research is equally as important. As today's report demonstrates, other companies already grasp this. They clearly see investment in biomedical research as an investment in their future. Yet, in the U.S., we're dangerously close to squandering our investment and the hard-earned leadership that we have built in this area over so many years. So our plea from the industrial sector is to ensure that we work together to create an environment where government support for biomedical research is strong enough to safeguard our scientific leadership and grow our economy. Thank you for the opportunity to share these comments. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the privilege of being here. And I'd particularly like to thank those of you who participated in the creation of this report. I think the perspective and the expertise, as well as the commitment and advocacy that are represented not just in your work, but in this report, are really of uh, vital importance to all of us. So Steve had asked if I would talk about, uh, make a few comments about the importance of consistently sustaining funding for biomedical research in the United States. Um, to follow, uh, as Scott has alluded to, to follow Dr. Collins uh, in talking about the research environment in the United States is a little bit like talking about rain with Noah in the house. <laughs> and so I'm not so sure that it would be better just to sit down and ask him to deliver his presentation again. <laughs> Try to soldier on. So this is a story that you could tell in a variety of ways. And in fact, we've heard those ways already. There's an economic story here that my colleagues have detailed in a variety of ways, in terms of return, in terms of jobs. If you just looked at the impact of NIH funding in the state of Maryland, it's 24,500 jobs, and if sequestration happens, 1,900 of those or so will disappear. But then you know many of those details as well or better than I do. There's a Johns Hopkins story here, right? So I'm here as the Vice Dean for Research in the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, and have that frame of reference, but wouldn't pretend that this is just a Johns Hopkins story. But for that slice of the tale, you could imagine a number of different implications. So Johns Hopkins was founded as a research institution, as a research university, first founded that way in the United States, and in 1893, four at the time men came together and made some important decisions that have really framed how we've pursued medicine, medical education, and medical research in the country. They came together and said it's important to put the clinicians and the trainees and the scientists in the same place. And in fact, many of the initiatives that Dr. Collins is championing, uh, championing 
emphasize just those points, and we, we work hard to how to uh, figure out how best to achieve that. We take very seriously not just leveraging those pieces, but doing work that will impact on patients, not just the one right in front of us. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician in addition to being a researcher. Not just the one right in front of us, but those at a distance. Our goal is to be a fantastic hospital, but not just to be the best community hospital in Baltimore. It's to impact on patients at a distance. And my colleagues have commented on young people, but I'd like to give you a slightly different twist on that. Their starting point for that was people who had already made a decision to go into science. That was Dr. Collins and Dr. Bruder's remarks. As we all know, in making our own decisions, it's a complicated process. We get information from a variety of places and we try to say what will make the most sense, what looks appealing. We're on the front line, as our colleagues are across the country, with young people who are electing to go into medicine in the first place, or once having elected to go into medicine, or electing what they would do in medicine, and are having to make a decision about whether or not this looks viable whether or not this looks appealing, whether or not this is in fact the way to cast their lot. So I have great concern that we in fact are forfeiting to other fields and maybe other countries the uh, brightest, best, most highly motivated young people who we need, not just want, but we absolutely need if we're going to solve the problems uh, in healthcare that are facing us. There's an international story, it's the one that's highlighted in this document, and it's been alluded to by my colleagues here. So as, uh, as you've heard, the U.S. has held the preeminent position in biomedical research for uh, at the least many, many decades, maybe not quite back fully to a century, but at the least many, many decades. And we know, as emphasized in this report, that others in other countries are aggressively pursuing this uh, field. They're aggressively playing in the space of ideas, of discovery, of product development, of public perception, of international perception. And as you've heard, we stand to lose as they play that uh, game progressively, aggressively. And the decisions that we make now are going to resonate over the next 10 to 20 years within that particular international space. But the story I would really like to emphasize to you in just a few minutes is that um, the real consequence of sustained funding has to do with you. It has to do with your family, it has to do with your neighbors, it has to do with any of us up here on this panel. Right? We stand on the platform or on the shoulders of all of those whose work before us has informed our present in biomedical research, giants like Dr. Collins. That's our current position. Um, my colleagues across the country add to that platform every day. We have never stood so tall. Much of what Dr. Collins was referencing in terms of his own work is emblematic of the progress we've made and the possibility that derives from that. I'm going to tell you four very brief stories of conversations in the first three days of this week at Johns Hopkins. And again, I'm not trying to tell you these are only Johns Hopkins stories, it's just my sample. Denny Wirtz is an engineer in the Whiting School of Engineering at the undergraduate campus at uh, Johns Hopkins. Denny is an ex uh, actually collaborates with Dr. Collins on a progeria project. Denny is an extraordinarily talented individual who has leveraged technology and approaches to bioinformatics to be able to interrogate small, single popula uh, populations of single cancer cells to understand what it means when those cells are different from each other in terms of the likelihood that they either will or won't metastasize to another site. It's extraordinary biology. Carol Greider won the Nobel Prize in 2003 for discovering telomerase. Mary Armanios is an oncologist working with her who now has identified that telomerase plays a role in two prevalent lung diseases, pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. And now our challenge is to understand how that uh, can be translated into new approaches to diagnosis and therapy. 
Cindy Rand and Kristen Reichert are psychologists trying to understand how behavior and adherence are determined and how we then impact on health care out of that. Roy Brower and Dale Needham are critical care physicians who have understood that those who survive respiratory failure and a stay in the intensive care unit are left with long-term disability and the observations they've made are driving basic discovery in terms of muscle biology as well as issues with regard to delivery of care. So what I would say to you is what's the implication of not consistently funding Federal, uh, federally funding biomedical research. And the implication is that we elect to jump off our predecessor's shoulders. That's, that's the consequence. Science is challenging, science is hard, but as Dr. Collins said, is an extraordinary adventure. We need young people to see this as both viable and appealing and worth the pursuit. And I think that the um, circumstances that we face now are making decisions about investment very specifically about investment. To truly improve healthcare, we need discovery, we need innovation, we need bi-directional translation, which I won't elaborate on here, but I think that's an important element of this tale. This is not just about going forward with what we know as we sit here today, and that requires investment. So I ask you to think about your health and your interaction with the healthcare system in the next five to 10 years. Are we gonna be positioned to precisely diagnose and treat you or your loved one? Or are we gonna be left with today's or yesterday's tools in doing that? I think that's the opportunity that we face and it's also the risk that we face depending on the decisions that we make. Thank you very much. Thank you to all, all three uh, great comments and uh, sobering comments, but I think ultimately uh, hopeful comments if we can uh, take the steps we need. I just want to make one quick comment and then open it all up to you for questions. But, um, Dr. Bruder made a comment about how this funding um, spurs companies like NIH funding uh, spurs his company and other companies like it to invest more. And one of the things you sometimes hear uh, in the debate about federal support for research, including NIH support, is well, this is either, either it crowds out private research because there's, a, in theory, a fixed number of scientists, which is, A, not true, uh, or it doesn't really uh, add anything. It's just a substitute, not a complement. And uh, we reviewed all, pretty much all of the literature on that question that economists and science, uh, researchers have looked at. The answer is it is not a substitute. It is a complement. The answer is very, very clear that one dollar of NIH funding produces on average 32 cents additional corporate funding of R&D. So the idea is somehow that we can just sort of walk away from this and the private sector, companies like Scott's, will pick it up, uh, just simply isn't the case. Uh, we, we need both of those systems. We need, we need, a, we need aggressive uh, public funding and then enables companies like Scott's and others to complement that and build on that. So let's open it up for uh, comments and then uh, we, we don't have a mic, I guess. Uh, so, I'm glad enough. Steve White from Ed Data Foundation. Dr. Collins, is it still true that 80% of the $30 billion is already committed and you only have about 20% uh, left for new research projects? So the question is about, the question is about the way in which NIH makes commitments uh, to multi-year funding. Most scientific projects do not get done in a single year. In fact, the cycle time uh, for a seriously innovative, <coughs> groundbreaking effort <coughs> generally runs to at least three or four years. The average duration of a grant from NIH is four years. So that means if we give an award, uh, basically this year, we have committed to that project uh, resources for the next three years after that. And that means that in any given year, uh, only about 20 to 25 percent of our budget is turning over as grants uh, finish their timetable and we then have the chance to decide what to do with those funds. That is a challenge for us, particularly if the circumstances are such that there are sudden downturns in funding as threatened, for instance, by the sequesters. Uh, that would result in a real decimation of that year's potential because while uh, the overall cut in the budget uh, for the sequesters uh, would be predicted to be in the neighborhood of 8% for the 
pool of investigators who are coming in that year, it would be much worse than that, about four times that uh, kind of time. And you can imagine what that would do uh, to the community. It is the way it is. Again, this is another argument where if I was king of the world, I would probably try to come up uh, with a plan uh, for how to support biomedical research that was multi-year. And so you could, you could actually make some plans and know what resources were available. That's not the system we have. Go here and then... Hi, I'm Myron Strapp with the National Academy. Uh, Dr. Collins, uh, Rob Atkinson had mentioned two ways in which NIH could increase its impact. Uh, fewer applications and more resources. But in fact, there are many other ways. Uh, I mean, research could be conducted more efficiently, perhaps. Uh, we can improve the transition uh, to innovation and technological development. That's one of Rob's main uh, points to make. Uh, we could provide incentives uh, for greater private investment. Uh, does NIH have a role to play in these other ways? And if so, how? Well, absolutely. So one of the um, recurrent topics when I sit around the table on Thursday mornings with the institute directors, and I had to do part of that on the phone on the way down here this morning, uh, is this very question. What could we do uh, to take the resources that we do have and utilize them with greater efficiency and still keep our most critical resource, which is the biomedical research community, those scientists that are doing the work, uh, in a circumstance where they don't become discouraged and, and give up because once they've disappeared from our ranks, they're not coming back. Uh, one certain area uh, that we've explored pretty vigorously uh, is partnership uh, with other components of the biomedical research enterprise, private foundations, uh, such as Gates Foundation, for instance, when we're working in the global health arena, or very much now uh, focusing on ways we could work more closely with the pharmaceutical industry um, and the new center at NIH, the NIH uh, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS, uh, is partly set up as means of providing a hub for exploring those kinds of partnerships that are not duplicative or competitive with pharmaceutical and biotech companies, but are actually encouraging us to work together in ways that we haven't previously been able to do. We have a major workshop coming up in just 10 days to look at the question of target validation. How is it that we can take all of the discoveries that are pouring out of basic science laboratories about the nature of disease and use that to prioritize what the next generation of drug targets should be? Companies are very interested in that. NIH has a lot of skills now to be able to apply new technologies to do that. It's likely that out of that will come a shared initiative where we will share the work and share the cost. And we have to think about that. I mentioned the heroes, the heads of international research organizations. We also have to be sure at these difficult times that we're working with other countries in ways uh, that avoid duplication and build the effort. The Cancer Genomics Project, for instance, now international, involving multiple countries, all putting their data into a common database that's immediately accessible. Maybe in the past, with the luxury of lots of funding, we wouldn't have felt that we needed to partner up with other countries. We need to, we should, it's a good thing to do. All of those are great things, but they cannot fully compensate uh, for the squeeze uh, that is happening uh, with this trajectory we're on right now. One other, uh, Myron, one other point I'd make, you, you mentioned, well, perhaps we could act get the private sector to do more. Um, one of the problems there is that there's a squeeze there as well. Absolutely. Uh, and from a policy perspective, if we want to, uh, we, we have a research and development tax credit which the life sciences industry utilizes, as do many technology industries, but uh, as uh, late as 1992, it was the most generous in the world. So what we've done with the R&D tax credit is sort of similar to what we've done with NIH funding in the last eight years. Uh, we now have the 27th most generous R&D tax credit in the world, not number one. Uh, you want to go to France and do biomedical. So France is increasing its biomedical research. I don't know what the French agency is, but they're increasing that. They also have an R&D tax credit that is six times more generous than ours. So they're building an ecosystem of federal funding for this, plus big incentives for biomedical companies to locate and expand there. We see the same thing in countries like Australia and India, six times better tax incentives. So, you know, it, it, I don't see this as a substitute. We've got to, we, you know, the problem is so great, we've got to do it on all fronts. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Wayne Schroeder, Lockheed Martin. Uh, Dr. Atkinson, you mentioned that the, one of the conclusions in the report was that biomedical research, <clears throat> pardon me, should be approximately one quarter 
of 1% of the GDP. Well, in a $16 trillion economy, 1% is about $160 billion. A quarter of that would be about $40 billion. So how would you perceive or does the report address how we would develop a consensus to get uh, biomedical funding up to that level and kind of over what period of time could that realistically be done? You're very good at math. <laughs> really good calculations. Of course, you're probably on your on your on your on your iPad bigger I, I than a. Okay, I'll yeah. sure. uh, Look, I think the most fundamental problem is not whether we like NIH or don't like NIH; it's whether we like investment. That's really the fundamental problem. So there are a lot of critical needs for our country that really are investment. You know, some people use investment as an offhand thing of any government spending. You know, home heating subsidies are investment because they, people are warmer and they're more productive or something. You know, home heating subsidies, you like them or not, they're spending. Uh, funding NIH is investment. And, and, and the definition of investment is you put money in and you get more money out. That's an investment. And that's clearly what this is. So we have to have a national consensus that while we deal with severe budget problems, we can't deal with that by cutting investment. We have to cut spending. And in our view, we have to raise revenues as well. Uh, you got to do both. So um, that being said, I think if we could get that broad consensus in, in, in Washington on both sides of the aisle, um, I think we'd make a, it would be a lot easier to do the lift of NIH. Now, with regard to NIH specifically, our own view is that as more and more people realize, as all the speakers have said, that we have a leadership position and we didn't get it by accident. We didn't get it because we happen to have a lot of sick people in the U.S. and therefore our, our competitive advantage is in health. I mean, that's not why. We got it because we, we wanted it. We fought for it. We invested in it. And that's the thing that's at risk today. And I think more and more people are beginning to see that. That this is not an industry we can take for granted. We've got to put in place a set of policies. And NIH funding really is at the base of that. It's, it's, it's the core of that that everything builds off of. So I'm optimistic that that, um, that insight will be uh, more widely understood. Uh, and as it is, then uh, that we can continue to grow NIH. So I don't see it as a, we're not going to do it tomorrow. We're not going to do it in the next few years. But over five to ten years, I think we can make that as a goal. Yeah, yeah and then here. Uh, Jeff Alexander with SRI. Um, one of the things we found from the last doubling of the NIH budget is that biomedical research does not exist in a vacuum. So it draws on other basic sciences. And I'm wondering if you could address the implications of your proposal for what we need to do in terms of overall R&D investment in other fields. Um, we're, 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 we're all of the abovers. Uh, we like it all. I mean, I suppose there's some stuff that some bizarre study somewhere that somebody did that's, you know, but no, um, we just like, pretty, I mean, we think that science funding is, it has got to be critical. I mean, it give you a good, a good statistic, so, which is up on our website. From 1957 to 1987, you look at the growth of corporate R&D and government R&D, it pretty much tracks the exact same line. And then 1987 to 2009, 2008, the lines essentially diverge. The corporate line just keeps on the same trajectory, although in the last few years it's kind of a, and the program line went like this. The delta between those two lines is about $115 billion. So you could make an argument that we are $115 billion short every year in terms of the kinds of investments we should be making. The problem with this is this is sort of one of those things about it's sort of the, the uh, remember the expression of the shoe that didn't fall or whatever that is. You, know, you don't know what we didn't miss. I mean, maybe we, maybe we could have come up with a cure for certain kinds of cancers. Uh, maybe we would have come up with uh, solar energy that really is good, that grid competitive and not now. Maybe we would have come up with incredible new materials. We just don't know. But I do know one thing, and that if, if we had kept on that path, we would be a lot more innovative, we'd be a lot more competitive. So, you know, I think, I think that's what we've got to do. So, yeah, I certainly agree. If we're going to see this competitiveness really re, re encouraged, it's got to be across many branches of science. And NIH recognizes that we actually fund more research in chemistry than the National Science Foundation, which people think of as the place where chemistry is supported because we see the connection uh, between chemistry and biology much more clearly than ever before. 
we need to support computational approaches uh, and, and uh, all the ways that that's going to teach us about how life works. Uh, we need to support engineering. Again, our partners at NSF, uh, USDA, uh, DOE, uh, NIST, uh, those are all critical uh, agencies for working together. And we are working together, I think, much more closely than ever because of this realization that these disciplinary boundaries don't make sense anymore. Science has brought us all together. Uh, yes, here, and then here. Um, John Reichard with uh, Congressional Quarterly. I was a little unclear on how you make the comparison in biomedical research in China versus uh, that of the U.S. I mean, you mentioned that China is going to be, uh, has pledged to invest $308 billion in biotech over the next five years. I, I mean, is that the same as biomedical research? I mean, can you sort of loosely think of it as, as biotech is biomedical research? And also, if you take into account uh, not just NIH funding, but the money that private companies in the United States spend on uh, biomedical research, how does that uh, you know, affect the comparison? Well, let me answer the first one. Maybe Stephen might answer the second one. Uh, I mean, we're happy to go into more detail. The, the, the simple answer is, boy, this data, these data are complicated. Um, that's the, I, I think what we need is we need a national and a global initiative to standardize biomedical data, uh, R&D data collection. <laughs> really very hard. But having said that, um, there's biomedical, so there's, there's medical and there's biological, essentially. Those are kind of the two big top-level categories. The Chinese numbers are really all of the above and even more. Um, so the Chinese numbers are really about just a massive amount of money thrown at things like the Beijing Genomic Institutes, uh, money thrown at companies, money oh, thrown, invested in companies, money invested in universities, money invested in national labs. The Chinese initiative is really kind of a big, broad scale. They have so much money and so much will that they're putting resources everywhere. Um, Stephen, do you want to answer that second question? Well, this report, stand <laughs> this report intended to look at the level of government investment in biomedical research. So that's where our focus was, as opposed to comparing the corporate level investment across countries. I think you can get into a conversation in China where you're saying, well, it's government and some of it's going through a state-owned enterprise. So that's something I think you can legitimately raise. But the overall point of the important members there were to look at the level of government investment and biomedical research investment. And as the report says, clearly page nine, that $308 billion over five years is roughly twice of what the U.S. government will invest in biotechnology. And if you then take into account the GDP, the discrepancy gets even more dramatic. Yeah, so the comparison for the U.S. was all, all not just NIH, that it was all, everything we're doing in all our agencies. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, Dolly Sokol with the Health Science Committee. Uh, this is for Dr. Collins. Since there's been talk about breaking down, the need to break down more disciplinary boundaries, I wanted to ask you about NIH's 27 institutes and centers, if you were king of the world, which I think were your words earlier. Uh, whether you had 30 billion or 40 billion, if you could re-envision what NIH looks like, what would that be? Well, people have certainly been uh, asking that question for some time as the NIH has grown over the years in, into a rather complicated organization with these 27 institutes. I don't think anybody who was designing uh, a organization of this sort to support biomedical research from scratch uh, would divide it up into this many different uh, categories. But you know what? It is what it is, and frankly, it works, and it works because the leadership of those institutes are remarkable scientists who really get it in terms of the fact that if any of us are going to succeed, we all have to work together to make that happen. Uh, in my uh, experience, it's never really been a barrier uh, to getting important science done. Sometimes it's a little complicated, a little awkward. I think it maybe diminishes our visibility. People aren't quite sure what NIH is because maybe they've heard about the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute or the Cancer Institute or the Diabetes Institute, and we're really all just one NIH. So on an organizational chart, it looks a little bit like a nightmare. In practical purposes, it really works well. Uh, okay. No, go ahead. I'm Jennifer Shee, I'm at the NCI, uh, SBI Art Development Center, and this question is for Dr. Bruder. I really liked your analogy about the relay race and how, what NIH's role is, and I guess being at the SBIR Development Center and wondering what the role of, of our particular uh, center should be in terms of what types of companies to be investing in, because 
a lot of startups are coming to uh, NIH for funding now because they're the drying up of private capital. Well, thank you for pointing out the important role of SBIR funding <coughs> research. Uh, I can't comment specifically on the role of, of your institution, but clearly, uh, in as much as we have a, a similar goal in looking at funding seed opportunities like you, uh, we want to make sure that, that there is sufficient intellectual property of the ideas that you want to in, that you will invest in. When we think about looking at opportunities that are going to be investments, we have to look at what the uh, what the market opportunity is as well, whether the development of the technology coincides with the need and the market need. We look at what is required to bring those product opportunities to market because one reason that the development expenses are so high, and we, you commented on that large gap that occurred between the 80s and about 2000, uh, that hundred some million billion dollar gap, is that the, the expenses associated with bringing products all the way through the market have gone up astronomically. And so, as you think about where you want to fund your, your, your new opportunities, I think you need to make sure you get appropriate commercial input at looking at what's necessary on the full translational side. And I hope that's close to the mark of what your question was asking. Okay, thank you. Yes, right here, and then maybe one more. Melissa Rhodes, also Lucky Martin. Um, you all recognize the importance of collaboration, multi multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, we've got the most communicative and collaborative in generation coming up right now. How do you ensure their success once they get into school, ma maintain their scientific degree, and then get out of school and work to get published in a highly competitive landscape and work to get the funding that they need in an even more highly competitive landscape? <laughs> So I think you just encapsulated a, a very complicated process of career development <laughs> uh, within a question, and I'm sure that I won't uh, do it justice. Uh, I think part of it is how do we, um, what's the expectation of people come in? And, and so there's a quote that says, if you want people to build a ship, you don't tell them to go pick up wood on the beach, you tell them about the vastness of the ocean. And I think that's where we are to some extent in career development and career choices. There are a variety of things that uh, we pursue, that our colleagues pursue, that are really tactical steps along the way to say um, you don't pursue this on an island, you engage with colleagues broadly, we create mechanisms to support that. But you think, you think down the road, you've got to pick up your eyes and say where do I want to be in one, two, five years, and what do I need to do now in order to achieve that? It's a lot of mechanical steps to some extent. My own view, was we, we invest an awful lot of energy and, and uh, time in this, is that the biggest piece is helping to identify people who um, have a passion about wanting to make an impact in this area, and then deciding for that person, what are the tools that we need to help you to develop and to put into your toolbox in order for you to express that passion in a meaningful way. I have one, one little comment that comes from a practical standpoint of uh, recruiting so many young and talented people into, into industry, which is different than what we see in academia. And that is uh, in part because of this high communicative capacity they have, is managing their expectations. So many of the young people that come into uh, my current company and other companies that I've been with, is they have this somewhat unrealistic expectation that they will become king of the world within three years of getting their degree. And while there's a delicate balance between uh, sharing with them the vision of what all of the oceans have to offer, we also, as well, let's say more senior and seasoned uh, investigators, have a responsibility to convey to them the virtue of patience and understanding. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> uh, but th there is you know, this virtuous cycle and, and I think it's important that they understand that. 
by the way, NIH is in the midst of a very uh, significant high-level analysis of the biomedical research workforce and what exactly uh, should we be doing with the levers that we have the ability to pull in terms of training to try to be sure uh, that we're producing the right number and the right uh, capability and, and quality of expertise in this next generation of scientists. It's challenging to do that when you don't know what the economic trajectory is going to look like, but we're doing our best. So, um, thank you. I, I was, let me just close. I promised we'd be out by uh, 11.20 and I have uh, 90 seconds left. Uh, back in the 1940s, Henry Luce coined the term the American century, and it really was the American century. Um, it was also, in some sense, the pharmaceutical century. Uh, the 21st century is going to be the biological century, and, and it's going to be the century where biology drives not just really radical improvements in human health, uh, and and you all know more than this, but I, from what I read, it sounds like we can cure major diseases. Uh, uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, uh, other things like that. And not just diseases, but enormous new uh, innovations in energy, uh, in agriculture. Uh, we face a big problem in, with, with climate change in terms of ability to grow crops that are, that are going to be climate resistant. Uh, so it's really going to be the biological century. But the real question, I think, on the table is not that. The question is, is it going to be the biological American century? And I really want it to be that. Uh, I don't want it to be the biological Chinese century. And not because I have anything against the Chinese. Uh, I just think this is so important. We do it better than anybody else. And we really do deserve that leadership. Uh, but it's not something that's just given to us. We have to, as, as that famous uh, stock commercials, we have to earn it every day. Uh, and that's really what I think is at stake here today. So um, I'm optimistic. I'm hoping we can do another panel in uh, 2012 that talks about how America regained our leadership and, and in the process created uh, hundreds of thousands of high wage jobs and improved our trade <coughs> balance and cured a lot more diseases and made more important breakthroughs. So I'm optimistic we can do that, but it really requires uh, that we take all the right steps to do that. So please join me in thanking a fantastic panel today. And thank you all.